How's it going, guys? What if I told you U.S. foreign policy stretched well beyond the United States and included organizations not associated with the government? How's it going, everybody? Welcome to Virtual History 360. I'm Mr. Wade, and this is, I don't even know what segment we're going to call this. It's kind of like a new little studio setup here. Maybe this will be the podcast. Maybe it'll be the interviews. We'll find out. All right. But for today, I kind of just want to review a little bit. You know, we've been talking in class about foreign policy and the goals of foreign policy and the one hand washing the other, right? But let's take it a step further and talk about different organizations. Now, some of these organizations are going to deal with, well, just military alliances. Some of these are going to be dealing with humanitarian issues. But all of them kind of fall under the umbrella of foreign policy. So let's kind of take a look. I got some notes here. What do you say we go through them? All right. I think for starters, we should talk about the United Nations. I mean, they're headquartered in New York City, so I mean talk about U.S. foreign policy. I mean, the hub is right here. But it really, their goal, when they talk about it, is to you know, maintain world peace, right? You know, through friendship, cooperation, and they have a bunch of members. But here's the kicker. There are five permanent members, the United States being one, Great Britain being another, France, China, and Russia are five permanent members on what's called the Security Council. Now, there are 10 other members that kind of get put in every two years, and so there's a total of 15, but these five permanent members, they have veto power over all the decisions. That's kind of a big deal. Now, typically, they all get along because, you know, looking at the bigger picture, everyone can agree what's needed. But every so often, you hear about, you know, instances where the countries will disagree. For example, Syria. France, Great Britain, United States are with one side, China and Russia allied with the other. So when the United Nations tries to make a deal or make a decision, the veto power has been used. And this is recent, okay? You know, but aside from just, you know, the big deals, you know, what they do is they try to bring peace. They'll send in troops if needed, but that's kind of a last, you know, last ditch effort. You know, and then following those, you know, it's not just, you know, the adults that they worry about. The United Nations also focuses on children. You ever heard of UNICEF? Well, that's what they are. That's the Children's, oh, where's it right here? The Children's Emergency Fund, UNICEF. You know, when I was growing up, there would always be people fundraising. You know, at the grocery stores, they'd have, like, little boxes for your change and stuff like that. Um, but really, it's designed to help kids around the world. And because it's kind of separate, although it's part of the UN technically, it's mostly you know funded through these fundraisers that we're, I was just talking about. Now, the UN you know helps children, tries to maintain peace in the world, but it also tries to bring justice. We have you know what's called the World Court in the Netherlands. It's in a little town called The Hague, and pretty much what they do is they try war crimes, and it's not always the ideal situation because you know in order to try someone you have to get them there. Right, but that's the world court, right? But I don't want to talk too much about that. We mentioned the military actions. We talked about, you know, alliances in the intro there. But what about NATO? After World War II, this is a big deal. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Okay, basically, it's a one hand washes another kind of agreement where if you attack me, it's like attacking everyone: the United States, Canada, and 22, I believe, other European countries wasn't always 22. You see, it was developed so that you could kind of have protection from the Soviet bloc back at, during the Cold War. Well, after the Soviet Union fell, those countries that kind of broke back or got their independence back rejoined NATO. Now, that's putting a little bit of pressure on Russia, don't you think? Maybe that's why there's so much going on today. I don't know. Let's see. But all these that I just listed there, they're kind of dealing with the governments, right? But those aren't the only organizations that are involved in these foreign policies in this world peace agenda. You know, right here, I think the biggest one, and, you know, as a U.S. history teacher, you know, you hear Clara Barton, you know, the founder of the Red Cross. 
Well, the International Red Cross has grown into so much more than just, you know, Battlefield, but that's still a big part. And it's interesting because, you know, they determine, you know, their symbol, the Red Cross, is the inverse of the Swiss flag because the Swiss are known for being neutral. So they went with that. And it's a symbol that they are neutral and they will help combatants from either side. They will treat the wounded from any side because they are not affiliated with one country or another. Now, this gives them great freedom because what they can do with that is they can go into any country. Most countries have no problem with the Red Cross coming in because they know that they're neutral. Now, what's really cool about this is um, the Red Cross has grown so much and is recognized so well that, you know, they've even gone, even though they're the quote-unquote the Red Cross, they've actually formed a Red Crescent as well so that they can be allowed into Muslim countries because, you know, that's a whole other issue. But they're still allowed in because they get to, they get the job done. Now, unfortunately, they get targeted more times than they should. You know, they should be, you know, clearly non-combatant. They're clearly neutral. But they get targeted sometimes by accident. But they're still out there doing the work. Along the lines of helping people and going out of your way to help people, that would be Doctors Without Borders. Doctors Without Borders, you know, basically, if you think about this, you know, in America, the healthcare system is a whole mess in and of itself. But medical care. These are doctors that are volunteering their time and going into dangerous areas. A lot of times it's disaster areas where they're going to try and offer free medical care. And they, they partner up with other groups. And then you have Oxfam, you know, trying to fight famine, which, oh my goodness, with the weather going on right now. Uh, let's see, Amnesty International I have listed down here. You know, they're looking out for political prisoners, you know, keeping human rights, no torture, stuff like that. Save the children, that's a big one. Just because it's not just the health care, like, you know, Doctors Without Borders or the Red Cross, but it's also working towards education. You know, education is a gateway to a lot of other things, so I like how they're fighting for that. And let's see. We have a couple other ones I want to talk about, and these are a little more political, so a little more government-oriented here. Getting back to that, we have the World Trade Organization, which a smaller offshoot of that is NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement which is kind of on its way out, it looks like, but that's still to be determined. You know, the negotiations are still ongoing as I'm filming this. So, But the World Trade Organization is all about free trade. You know, the idea of protectionism, you know, protecting your country using tariffs. You know, if I make something and I sell it for $2 and you make something and it imports and you sell it for a dollar, people are going to go for the cheaper good more likely than not. So you put a dollar or $2 tariff, tariff on it, your good costs $3, mine costs 2 Hopefully you buy mine. But in the global world that we live in, is that really the best? I don't know. Wouldn't it be ideal to... Uh, my watch keeps buzzing. So we're, uh, it's okay. Um, so, you know, the idea of globalization and everyone trading with each other. And then NAFTA is kind of an offshoot of that. That includes Canada, Mexico, and the United States. So really quickly, I just want to hit on a couple of these. I want to recap organizations you know this is all jumping off of the foreign policy ledge here we have the united nations you have nato you have the red cross you have doctors without borders you have the world trade organization you have nafta all of these organizations although not working together all try to accomplish the same goal you know they all want world peace they all want everyone to be prosperous they all want everyone to be healthy and educated so i think we can all agree that you know they're pretty much worthy of support right not everyone agrees with them because not everyone sees them in the same light. People don't want to give up all their power. You know, the United Nations is fighting that. But if you take the balance, it seems like the good will outweigh the bad. I don't know. What do you think? Let me know. Leave a comment down below. Which organization do you think is the most important? Which organization do you think is the most corrupt? I don't know. I want to hear from you. So. Just going over these orders, uh, leave a note below. Of course, you know, for Virtual History 360, you know, go ahead and hit that like button so I know if it's good or not. Let me know what you think about the new studio. You know, and go ahead and subscribe if you haven't and share this out, let people know. And check out my other videos. I think they're on this side over here. All right, so for Virtual History 360, I'm Mr. Wade. Thank you.